Today we're going to do a little different uh, than what we've been doing. Uh, we have sort of been following the uh, the teachings that we've had on uh, Wednesday night, but I wanted to go a little different direction today, and so we're back in the, the lectionary. And you know, we read about people today that uh, what's called the the nuns. Not I don't mean Catholic nuns, but N O N E nun. And these are people that do not subscribe to any particular religion. They would say, if you ask them, what denomination are you or what religion are you, they might reply, none. Uh, therefore, the nuns. And we, we've read a lot about how that the, this is kind of on the rise. And also that uh, the people that describe themselves as religious are not as many as at one time. And so, uh, you know, that's alarming for, for some people. And so a lot of people would say that, well, I don't really subscribe to any particular religion. But I, I'm going to suggest today that we really, uh, all of us really do worship something. I think uh, Bob Dylan wrote a song one time, you got to serve somebody. And anything that you put your allegiance to and, and it devotes your time to and, and, you know, it's something that you, it really is important to you, can be a God, really. It can be something that we, that we worship. And so maybe, <clears throat> maybe it's not that uh, we, we have statues, but maybe we all have something that, that we worship. And so we talk a little bit about that. As we look into the scripture today, uh, we're looking at Acts chapter 17, verse 22. And the Apostle Paul here is at a place that's uh, a very interesting place. It's uh, called Mars Hill. And in the, uh, the place where the uh, religious people were at that time, they were very... Uh, they, they, the Greeks and the Romans had many, many gods. And so they had all these gods erected and they worshiped them. And of course, there was the one that they weren't sure about. And just in case they missed one, they had uh, they had one for the unknown God. So verse uh, verse 22 there. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and he said, ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him I declare to you. And so Paul is saying to them, <clears throat> you know, there's, there's a God that you don't know, but you want to worship him anyway. I want to tell you a little bit about that God. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. So right from the bat, uh, he's letting them know that, that the gods that are made with hands are no gods at all. Neither is worship with uh, men's hands as though he needed, as though he needed the, anything, seeing he giveth all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation. That they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. And I think uh, the point there that Paul. Apostle Paul is making is that if you seek God, you can find him. And so today, I, I think uh, there's a lot of people, as we look at in a world today, there's a lot of spiritual hunger and there's a lot of searching. And people don't even know what they're searching for. They don't know what it is that they really need. But there's a lot of searching today. And so I think that's evident by uh, today with the many people who have tuned into all the religious broadcastings and stuff. And uh, many of them don't go to church on a regular basis. But people are searching for something. <clears throat> and uh, 
A fellow by the name of David Zoll, I think it is, uh, has written a book, and he, he kind of coined this word. It's a new word that he came up with, and uh, seculosity is the word. He took the words, combined the words secular, uh, secularism and religiosity, and put those together and in a way to describe a lot of people today, seculosity. That it's, it's maybe we think it's the rise of secularism, and really, maybe it is that people are really searching for something and they're worshiping things may, they may not even realize that they're worshiping. And so if we think about that, that's what the Apostle Paul, when he comes to Mars Hill, he's meeting all these people here. And these are very intelligent people that he's dealing with. And Paul was very intelligent. And I want you to know that he did not walk up to them and just begin to blast them and to denounce all their gods. He would have not gotten anywhere if he had done that. He didn't put them down. He didn't tell them they were stupid. He didn't tell them they were sinful, that they were wicked, which is what a lot of people would do today. Instead, he met them where they were. And I think if we can meet people where they are and try to find out where they are instead of just... Uh, judging them based on what they look like or, or what maybe whatever they're going through and just say we want to meet you where you are. Paul did that. And when you do that, Jesus, remember Jesus met the woman at the well and he met her where she was and he began a conversation with her. And the problem is a lot of times people are too religious to have a conversation with people who are not religious or people who are different from us. And then we're not able to get anywhere with them. That's why they don't want to listen to us or many times want to come to where we are because we, we have shunned them so many times. And so I think the Apostle Paul's approach could be the best approach. And what he did is he entered a conversation with them and really a relationship with them. And he met them where they are, were and able to be able to say at some point, you know what? I want, let me tell you about my experience with God. Let me tell you about my understanding of God. And I think that's really where, where he's coming from. And so as we think about uh, the, some of the things that we may worship today, some of the things that we may uh, look to, Here's a few of the things that uh, Zal mentions that is part of our seculosity today. Let's see if we can pull these up here. First of all, busyness. Busyness can become an idol to us today. I, I think uh, it remains for us to think about all the people before this pandemic, how busy we all were. And in a sense, busyness becomes the thing that fills the emptiness and the void in our lives that only God should really be the one to fill. And I think sometimes that we're so busy, not always, but in some cases, we get so busy because we don't want to stop and to be quiet because that forces us to be alone with ourselves. And what is it that we're afraid we're going to find when we're alone with ourselves? Maybe ourselves. And so we, there's certain things that we do that we don't want to think about. We don't want to think about uh, things like doubts and things like death. Because sometimes it's only in the quietness when we get alone with God that we actually are confronted with those, those things and those thoughts. But as long as we stay busy, we don't have to worry about those kind of things. Uncertainty, doubts, and death. Uh, and so, you know, you ask somebody sometimes how are things going and, and they will automatically say, I'm, I'm very busy. And it could be that we're trying to fill the, the void in our life that God's supposed to fill with busyness. And that can be an idol to itself. Also, romance today. Now, the love partners become the, the, the divine ideal that we are allowing God to, <clears throat> or allowing someone else to fill the part in our life that only God can really feel. And, you know, I'm not saying that, that you know, God gave us people in our lives to, to help us in, in times 
that we need help. But at the same time, if we're trying to find someone else to fill the part in our lives that only God can fill, that, that God-shaped hole, it will never work. Hence the woman at the well who had had, Jesus said, had had five husbands, and yet she still wasn't satisfied. And the relationships were not satisfying her like she wanted. And one of the problems today is we feel like that if we can get more of something, then we will be uh, enough. We'll have enough. Enough money. Enough uh, love or enough uh, fitness or whatever it is. If we get more and more and more, we'll, have, we'll be enough and that we will be adequate. And the problem is we find that when we get all those things, it's not enough and we don't feel adequate. And so it's not in those things. God created us with this, uh, again, a God-shaped hole, and we need to think about that. And so that's another one. And then parenting can become an idol. Uh, the rise of what, uh, in his book, he talks about the rise of helicopter parenting where we can hover over our children to the point that we we want to be their savior and do everything for them. And we feel like that their enoughness will come from us rather than from God. So even that can become an idol if we're not careful. And, and you know, we live in an age today, it's a lot different than it used to be uh, when, you know, I'm not saying we go back to that, but, you know, there was a time when, when children had their proper place. And, and, you know, today it's almost like they're on the throne. And we put them on the throne as parents. But, so I have to be careful with that. And then food. Food uh, is, is something that Zoll mentions that can be uh, really symbolic of our values. And, and today even the uh, educated class are, are becoming to where this is, is such a, an important thing in, in their lives. Uh, food can be that. It, it's, it, it has become invested with the, the meaning of life for a lot of people. We see all tons of shows about that. And so we have to be careful that, you know, God gave us food uh, to sustain us, but it should not become our life, okay? And so these, these are all things. Technology. I want to hit somebody with one of these. Technology, you know, we, we bow our, ourselves to the, uh, the screens as a way of distracting reality sometimes. And so we immerse ourselves in, in technology. Uh, we, again, we, we flee boredom because we might be afraid of what we find when we're bored and maybe it's finding ourselves. And so technology is something else that can cause us to, to put all our thoughts into and, and, and actually almost like an idol. And here's another one. Politics. Uh, politics uh, can become an idol for us. It's uh, when we take uh, today, you see people taking political stances and and making religious claims based on politics. Like you can't be a Republican and and, and uh, be a Christian at the same time or you can't be a Democrat and be a Christian at the same time. You can't vote for this guy and be a Christian. And so it becomes a religious stance for so many people. And it allows the person to feel like they, they matter, especially when they're afraid that they don't matter, I think. So we have to be careful. All I'm saying is these are some things that's listed here, but it could be anything. Anything. I, I remember when I was a young man, before I became a Christian, that I began to uh, listen to. I, I, I became a, a Beatle fanatic. I still like them, but I'm not as crazy as I once was about them. Uh, and I was, you know, the Beatles were, by the time I even knew her, they, who they were, they had already broken up. You know, this, this was probably in the 80s when I started listening to, to the Beatles. And I think for me it was an escape because at that time I had a lot of things going on in my family. And a lot of things that weren't, uh, weren't good for a young man. And so I, I, I went to the, uh, the record store. My cousin owned a record store in Paintsville called The Arrival. And my grandma gave me $2 a day for lunch. Now, back in that time, that was a lot of money for lunch. And uh, instead of buying my lunch, because I actually got free lunch. I don't know if she knew that. But I actually put the money on, on all the albums that I got. So I went to the record store and I laid away every Beatle album. And it was, you know, a few hundred dollars probably. 
And every day or every week, I'd pay, uh, it was two, you know, $2 a day, you know, $10 a week, whatever, and I'd pay that on until I got them all paid off. She, it was years later before she found out about it. But anyway, I, I would take those records, and I had my headphones at home, and I would sit in my room, and I would listen to those. And I still love music, don't get me wrong. I'm still a music person, and, and uh, when I'm exercising or whatever, I, I love to listen to music. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but for me, it was my escape. In, in a way, though, it was better th than it, some people would have, uh, than I could have been. You know, it could have been drugs or a lot of things like that. And so it, it was certainly better than some of the things that people get into today. And so those things can be good things. But at the same time, uh, I, I think in some ways it, it was my, my savior. So that when I became a Christian, I had to deal with the, the idea of whether I was going to have to burn my albums and get rid of everything. But here's what I found out. That once I became a Christian and I began to worship God, that these things did not have the same values they once had. They did not have the same allegiance as they once had in my life. They sort of took a back seat. And God became my king and my savior and my escape. And so all I'm saying is this, that, that we all have things that we need in our lives to help us uh, in this life to, to forget about the troubles of this world. And, you know, I say that all the time, whether it's a walk, uh, you know, a, a walk with a friend or, uh, you know, a walk in the woods or, or music, whatever it is, those are all good. And I'm not saying they're bad. But the point is that if, if we allow these things to replace our relationship with God, then how are we any different than the people on Mars Hill? For example, if we're allowing a partner or a romance to replace God in our life, then Aphrodite is still alive, right? We, we have to understand that, that we can make a God really out of anything. And we have to be careful about that. And so that's what the Apostle Paul says there in uh, in verse 28, he says, For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Paul actually quoted a couple uh, poets in this, uh, in this passage that they would have been familiar with, and he appealed to, their, appealed to their intellectuality. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. And the, the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. And so the Apostle Paul here takes them and meets them where they are and says, I, I notice you have, uh, you know, very religious. I notice you have all these gods and, and, uh, and you even have that one as the unknown God. Well, let me tell you about this God the one that you don't know about. I kind of know who he is. And he begins to take them to a place to finally, he reveals to them that this God that they don't know is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, there's a lot of people today that have not, I believe, gotten to the place where they fully understand God. You know, for example, in, in AA, they have uh, what they refer to as a higher power. And I believe that a lot of people have been helped by AA, even though some of them have not came to the knowledge of Jesus Christ yet. But I believe that God can help people where they are. And that if you're searching for God, and you find, if you begin to search where you are, that God will lead you to a revelation of who He really is. The more you become, the more you search, the more light that you accept, the more light you will get. And so we find him when we're, you know, Jesus said, if, if you'll search me, you'll find me. And that's what we need to do today. And so uh, just, just to point out that, you know, we can all uh, allow things to come in our way and in, in our lives to search, in our search for God. So I'm going to ask uh, 
at this moment, if the uh, musicians will come back up, we're going to get a song on 420, uh, on the screen, actually. Let's say a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for our time together. And I want to pray for everyone, Lord, who's listening, whether present, Lord, or online. God, that you would touch them today. God, forgive us and lead us in the way you'd have us go. In Christ's name, amen.